Hello, everyone. I'm your co-host, DJR Stewart. Welcome to Black Man Speak. And I'm your co-host, T.D. Duncan III, otherwise known as T.D. 3. Jimmy, it is Wednesday night, December 13th, 2023. And if it's Wednesday night? It is certainly Black Man Speak. So we want to thank uh, Liquid for providing our theme music. And our own studio in Forest Films for subsidizing our virtual studio. If you haven't already, please hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and spread the word. If you're here watching the show, invite a friend so you guys have something interesting to talk about uh, the rest of this week. With that being said, Tom, I know we have a, a jam-packed show. We have the Professor Glover uh, back on our show. Very um, talented, intelligent brother. He always brings some good information when, he, uh, when he's on our show. And uh, we have our birthday segment, and we have a uh, film recommendation. So we have a lot to get to, so let's do what we do, Tom. All right, Jimmy, we're going to go ahead and get this party started right as we are wrapping up uh, the year. It is midway through the December, Jimmy, and uh, we're just going to make this thing happen. So uh, for those of you who are out there who have December, mid-December birthdays, we're going to uh, highlight a couple of folks that you may be sharing a birthday with uh, if sure. you are uh, celebrating a birthday within the next week, Jimmy. So, you know, this this first gentleman that we're going to highlight, Jimmy, I don't think there's anybody who doesn't know this guy. He is a multifaceted, multi-talented genius when it comes to entertainment, Jimmy. Uh, he's been in films. He's been in music. Um, he's, uh, I think, been on TV shows. A little bit of everything, Jimmy. And he has a birthday today. That is a talented Jamie Foxx. Jamie Foxx, very talented brother, yes. Actually kind of a, a close to hometown boy from Terrell, Texas, just a couple of yes, hours away bro. from Dallas, Texas. And, of course, we are wishing him a happy birthday today. Hope he is out enjoying himself. We know that he had some health challenges. Um, he was in the hospital for a while earlier this year. We talked about that. We covered him for a while. And, uh, you know, hopefully we will see him. And some other in some other uh, great films, Jimmy. If I think of some of the greatest films that this guy's been in, there. Yeah, well, Ray was my favorite. Uh, I thought that that performance was excellent. Which one? Ray. Ray, Jimmy, you're correct. And then also the Django. Oh, I mean, I liked him in the Django also. Um, but man, Ray was was. I mean, he had to bring so much of that character to bring it to lifetime to make it realistic. You know. Um, I mean, he, did a, he did a great job in the Django. I enjoyed the movie, uh, especially like the ending. And, uh, but uh, yeah, Ray, man, that was awesome. That performance was, ooh, was awesome. <clears throat> I mean, Grammy Award winning, multi talented, multifaceted. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. Our next uh, birthday baby coming up this week for those of you who enjoy uh, comedy, JB Smooth. This brother has uh, been around for a while, been in a, a lot of uh, films, a great comedian. And uh, he is celebrating a birthday on December the 16th, which is a couple of days. Well, you know what? And actually, our movie recommendation, uh, Almost Christmas, he plays in that also. So you guys may want to go check that out on Hulu. Uh, just to, And congratulate the brother for on his birthday. So All right. Our next birthday is the beautiful and talented Angie Stone. She has a birthday coming up on uh, December the 18th. So I uh, want to definitely give her a early, uh, early happy birthday shout as well. Happy birthday, sister. And last but not least, uh, for those who've been around for a while, this gentleman here is an actor, uh, really made his name as a, uh, a model uh, back in the day, Jimmy, but kind of transitioned to that. And I think he's been on some uh, television shows as well. Uh, okay. Tyson Beckford, his birthday is on December okay. the 19th. Uh, very talented brother. I've uh, seen him around on several projects. So, uh, yeah, happy birthday! Um, and Tom, this is a is, is, is this a short list. We need to start yeah, having we're, we're doing short. We're doing short, short list because uh, we've got so much content we've got to deal with today, Jimmy. That I I cut it down short. We usually do about yeah, we usually do about seven to eight. But you know, uh, Professor Glover comes with the fire. We we can't really waste any time. Uh, getting the press. Okay. That's a glove. So I just decided to do a short list this time, but I did want to take a minute to uh, bring some news, Jimmy, with a heavy heart for those uh, who probably heard yesterday uh, that a, a, a local hometown hero, I'll call him, 
uh, Craig Watkins uh, just passed. <coughs> oh, no. Yeah, just passed yesterday. <clears throat> I mean, he, of course, was the first African-American uh, DA in Dallas County. Jimmy did a lot of great work. I actually knew Craig, interestingly enough, from when we were little kids. We played Pee Wee football together, different teams, but uh, did a lot of good in uh, city, helped a lot of people who had been forgotten about, gotten a lot of uh, brothers and sisters, you know, out of uh, being incarcerated. Jimmy, who you know, had been forgotten about it, and it caused a lot of controversy because folks just didn't like that. Well, Tom, you know, uh, you guys know that I'm a far right wing conservative Republican. And just by principle, I just don't make it a point to vote for Democrats. But um, but he is one brother that I, I would definitely have found myself voting for. I was um, really hoping he got we would get reelected when he ran for for a second term. I was very disappointed in Dallas and the people in Dallas County when they did not reelect the brother. because I thought he did some great work and I'm sorry to see him go. Well, you know, Jimmy, uh, that's. Unfortunately, what happened? Well, it's been a lot when 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 I will admit that I would vote for a Democrat. So yeah, uh, that's showing uh, uh, that's saying a lot. So yeah, but um, yeah, I really appreciate the work that he did, and I certainly uh, you know thought that he was not appreciated enough, you know, for the work that he did. And then the, the person who the district attorney that came after that, I'm not even sure she even completed a term. Uh, was sick, didn't show up for work. Um, you know, like, what kind of mess is this that the brother was on his job, doing the work, somehow can't uh, get reelected, and then the person y'all elect can't even make it to work? Well, you know, unfortunately, Jimmy, some folks did not like him uh, providing justice to those who had been wrongfully uh, in prison, Jimmy, and so they uh, didn't want him getting any more uh, folks out of jail who had been wrongfully in prison, Jimmy. But, you know, there's always a political story behind that. But, you know, we want to, his, his legacy has been cemented uh, in history. He's done great work. He has a young family, young boys, and definitely mm -hmm. our prayers to his family, his friends, yeah. and his loved ones, you know, passed way too early. Uh, we're actually the uh, same age, and uh, definitely our prayers to his family and to the community that loves him. Yes. That is true, ditto. Gotcha. All right, Jimmy. Well, unless there is something else, we would like to go ahead and transition. Well, uh, we do have our, 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 our film clip uh, oh, okay. for our movie recommendation. I wanted to show it last week when you get a chance to uh, do it. We had some technical issues. But um, let's play it now before we get to the professor. All right, Jimmy. Let's let him roll. Make it to Christmas, are we? Yeah. 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 Not a damn chance. Nothing says the holidays quite like family. I wasn't expecting you for another day or two. Your room's upstairs. But the liquor's in the dining room. Baby, baby, hey, Walter. Is the family coming for Christmas? Every single one of them. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. So where's your husband? Ex-husband. Oh. Hey, Rachel. You know he's single. Okay, mama. So sorry about your loss. The African-American woman is the backbone of the black family. Who is this white man? What's up with those pink pants, Malibu Barbie? <laughs> they gonna kill each other out there. Uh-oh, somebody got a boyfriend. I got vibrators older than that child. Get it, seven. You burn a macaroni. It was gonna be disgusting. I did you a favor. Do me a damn favor. Don't burn down the damn house. Oh, God, oh, God. Oh. What the hell did y'all do? You can't afford to buy me no more outfits like this. This is my Chaka Khan. Chaka Khan. Chaka Khan. All I'm asking is for five days for you all to act like a family. You all should feel like a bunch of dumbasses. This gonna blow my buzz. If I close my eyes, I can see mom in here like it was yesterday. She is here. She's in every pot, in every pan. We are standing on holy ground. My husband's gonna kill himself. Nothing like positive reinforcement for the holidays. That's not good. Come on, Santa Claus. Time to go get them ho ho hoes. Did you find everything you need? Sometimes you find things that you're not even looking for. Baby. Boy, I'm a grown ass woman. I'ma stab your ass with this fork. Do you hear me? I would love that. Well, at least we know it can't get any worse. Lonnie? Oh my god. Oh my god. You two know each other? Mm-hmm. 
Oh, 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 oh my God. God! What the hell is going on? I'm his wife, you dumb bitch. Who you calling a dumb bitch? You, you dumb bitch, young bitch, silly bitch, dead bitch. She got the gun, bitch. Lonnie, if you're gonna bring bitches in here, bring a smart bitch. I'm too old for this. You sound beautiful, Aunt May. All right. Looks pretty interesting, Jimmy. Yeah, it's a pretty funny movie, so if you guys get a chance, uh, go check it out on Hulu. And um, it wouldn't hurt to mention to, to the Hulu Corporation that you know we did uh, recommend their, one of their movies, so they decided they want to sponsor us. All right. Sounds good. All Here's right. Time to bring on the professor and let's uh, do what we do best. All right. All right. Now it is time to welcome the man, the myth, the legend, Professor Clarence Glover, AKA Professor Freedom, uh, activist, historian, community organizer, minister, a man of all seasons. He has been with us uh, multiple times before to talk about several different time. topics, oh, yeah. Juneteenth, watch night, a lot of different things. And we had to have him back, of course, before the end of the year to talk about some things that he has going on right now. And so Professor Glover, we wanna thank you for coming back. How you doing my good brother? I'm doing great, uh, uh, gentlemen. I'm glad to be with you again, and thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. So uh, we were talking. Always a pleasure. We were talking recently, Professor, and uh, you were talking about some projects that you've been working on for the majority of the year, some exhibits, and one of one got to get caught up on uh, what's been happening this year. Uh, we typically have you on the end, of, have you uh, uh, talk to us at the end of the year to talk about watch night, different things. But there are some things you've been working on this year. We want to talk about a little history. Uh, some th projects that you've been working on, and see where that takes us today. So let's uh, let's get this ball rolling and, and get us up to speed with what you've been doing lately. Well, uh, this has been a very productive year for for me. Um, one of my areas of specialty in my uh, growing up, I'm retired now, uh, having uh, worked at SMU as director of intercultural education and professor of African American studies, and uh, was at assistant superintendent at DSD for multicultural education. So now I have a great deal of time to spend focusing on African-American history and culture. And uh, I grew up in uh, Northwest Louisiana in the middle, in the midst of cotton fields. My great grandfather owned the plantation land. We had many people who picked our cotton plus my ancestors were uh, back in slavery, of course, uh, as many of our African-American descendants were. And, um, and so we, we, we uh, experienced that reality as well. And so I've been spending a lot of time focusing on uh, this past year, the fourth Monday in October uh, is African American Cotton Pickers Day. And we had a great celebration this year, recognizing our African American Cotton Picker, Mr. Uh, 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 Chippo Bailey from Waxahachie, uh, Texas. And prior to that, uh, I was with the Waxahachie community uh, in Ellis County, should I say, the entire Ellis County, which is the largest cotton producing county in the nation. And they had a historical mm. market that was established there, placed there in Ellis County. And the city of Waxahachie uh, gave us a proclamation proclaiming uh, the fourth month in October as African-American Cotton Pickers Day. It's the first city to do so in the nation. We're going to ho we hope that Dallas will be coming along next because Dallas is a city just as Fort Worth is called Cattletown. Dallas was built on cotton. Uh, and I'm hoping that we will have that proclamation and declaration of Dallas as a cotton town in the future. The assistant, we um, also, uh, this is the 150th anniversary of Deep Ellum, uh, which is downtown uh, uh, area, uh, which was founded in 1873 by freed African men and women. One of the African American freedmen towns uh, here in the area, we had several up north, Alpha Road, uh, where I live, Elm Thicket, North Park, uh, Joppe, 10th Street, uh, Short North Dallas, and so forth. So what I've been doing here, uh, and I think you have a poster there, uh, the, uh, we're having what is called Cotton Pickers, Christmas, and the Blues. Uh, it's an exhibition that I'm putting on uh, beginning Saturday, the 16th. Uh, I'll be there on Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, and Sunday, which will run through January the 1st. Our opening will be the 16th on Saturday, and our closing will be December 31st, which is Watch Freedom Eve. 
at two o'clock. And we'll be there at two o'clock on Saturday. So we invite you to come out and be with us. Uh, and we'll go through what we're doing because it's important that as the year uh, celebration, they've been celebrating 150 uh, years down in Deep Ellum, but there was not an African-American perspective to this particular celebration. Uh, when we go back to the roots of Deep Ellum and all freedmen communities and towns, which were founded after 1865, they were founded by African-American men and women, pioneers uh, of freedom. Mm. So subsequently, uh, I felt it important uh, for me to make my contribution to that. And so I'll be uh, ex uh, sharing some of my personal memorabilia, as you just saw, uh, shackles, uh, cotton, uh, 500 pound bells of cotton. Uh, I pick cotton, I'm a cotton picker. Uh, you'll see a 110 pound, over 110 pound bag of cotton, uh, 10 foot sack, things like that. Uh, and other uh, memorabilia. Uh, at the exhibit, we'll be uh, also sharing the blues, the origin of the blues, the music, uh, Hedy Ledbetter, uh, Bessie Smith, uh, the blending into the gospel tradition as well. And basically talking about how from the South, uh, how they came here, Stephen of Austin, who stated that we can that they could rise out of poverty by coming to Tejas or Texas by raising cotton, but they could not do it without the slaves. So subsequently, um, this ex ex exhibition will be there, and we'll be engaging in gallery talks, conversation, and education uh, here in Dallas. So okay. you, you said something, a couple of things that are very interesting that, that I'm hoping our listeners have, have picked up on. And, and before we go to that, I want to acknowledge a couple of our, our uh, listeners in the chat room. Um, uh, Brother Asar al Kabalan out of the Austin area. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Uncle Asar. Brother Asar, Ms. Dominique Bynings um, out of Atlanta, Georgia. Good evening to you, Ms. Audrey K. Booker out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. There was Chastity Christian um, out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. She is an educator as well. Brother Frederick B. Roberts out of the Prairie View area. And then, of course, uh, Brother Ed Gray, the commission, who actually connected us uh, initially as well. So I always have to thank uh, Ed for not only supporting us, but connecting us with you as well. But a couple of minutes ago, and something that probably is lost to a lot of young people, uh, when you mentioned that Deep Ellum was founded by three African-Americans, correct? By African-American people, uh, Freedman Towns, these were men and women. We don't have the actual name of, of all of them. I mean, uh, really, uh, the early 1873, we do have, which I've been able to locate since my research has started, there was a place called Bob Alley down in Deep Ellum. I was able to find out that Bob Alley is actually a man. His name was Jacob Bob. And we've now identified him, his family. And, and so we know a name of a person and a family that, uh, African-American family that lived in the early uh, area near Baylor Hospital. And so we were putting together these pieces. And for those of you who are from Dallas, and the, 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 the interesting thing for me coming from Shreveport, particularly because Shreveport was the last Confederate uh, capital where this flag was taken down during the Confederacy. But Texas was the state uh, at the time under Stephen of Austin, as I said, Moses Austin, the, they were called impresarios that became the place where they would come and, pro and, and bring their enslaved African people and protect their most prized property, which were African people uh, here in Texas. So there's a very unique uh, uniqueness about the Republic of Texas, uh, which was founded in 1836, uh, and the whole uh, antebellum South, which was a short-lived history here, uh, about 60 years, uh, with uh, uh, William Miller, Brown Miller, the Carruth plantations and others, but also with the story of uh, Anderson Bonner who came out of slavery in 1865 in North Dallas, who owned over 2,000 2, acres of land, the Bonner family, uh, White Rock uh, area, and, and ultimately became North Dallas near Medical City. So there's a lot of history in the, in the city of Dallas that many African-Americans do not know about because it was systematically uh, held uh, from the African-American community here. So now we're trying to bring that forth so that we can better understand, particularly around the issue of cotton, which Dallas was the largest inland cotton exchange in the world. And Elm Street was the major cotton market at the time where they would bring the cotton bells and uh, begin, they would trade them in the, uh, later on in the cotton uh, uh, 
exchange. But Robert Munger brought the cotton gin from Mejia, Texas. Uh, he improved upon what Eli Whitney had uh, patented. Uh, some suggest that uh, it was like another African, an African American man uh, who actually invented. But uh, it was Robert Munger who brought it from Mejia and, and down on Trunk Street in Deep Ellum that gave rise to this uh, improved machinery later on called Continental Gin. See, the word gin simply means engine, cotton, mm -hmm. cotton engine, short for engine, gin. So uh, Texas, this, 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 the city of Dallas is significant. So uh, uh, in, in, the, in the thrust, the nation into the Industrial Revolution. So that's a major part of Texas, i.e. Dallas history. And that's a part of Texas, Dallas history that a lot of people, quite frankly, don't know. I did not know, Professor Glover, about some of the history of Deep Ellum until I was well into adulthood. And that was only because my father, who grew up in Dallas, uh, 1941, uh, knew some elements of that history. And he actually taught history. He was a career high school teacher. And he started talking to me about some of the history of Deep Ellum that I had no idea about even growing up in Dallas. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's important. And, and, and as we talk about history and slavery, and, and, and as I tell people, when you look at what has been done, I, I, I understand, and we should all understand, when any people, no matter what culture, it's in Africa, Europe, Asia, whenever there's a conquered people and a conqueror, uh, the conquerors always write, rewrite the story, of course, uh, and suppress the story. It is responsibility of the conquered to uh, liberate itself. And that's why uh, I speak about my name, uh, AKA Professor Freedom. Uh, these were once on our bodies, you see, limited us in movement. But there is a statement that said that the greatest weapon that the oppressor has in his hand is the mind of the oppressed. So Professor Freedom, uh, I, we take the chain off your brain so your mind can work. And so as we uncover knowledge, as they said, write it in a book and hide it from us, as we read more, study more, uh, and we always talk about this, well, we are talking about this whole thing about book banning, et cetera. And I tell people the first book should be in your home, gentlemen. Correct. Uh, parents are the first educators. Correct. Uh, then the church community is the second educational group, um, you see. And then the third is the public education, i.e. .e. the private education. But your home, your church, or your religious community should be first uh, in educating. We must do a better job of that. We are not doing a great job. My generation, I'm 67. Uh, many of us in my generation have not done a good job. We were the first generation, you might say, to begin the uh, process of uh, getting opportunity. You know, I remember in the 74, I worked for IBM uh, in 74, back in the 70s. Uh, those doors for us were opening, you see. Uh, but as you said, your father, although I'm history and philosophy, theology, uh, major backgrounds and so forth. But those of us who got in the door had a responsibility also to create institutions as we did during slavery and Jim Crow. It, it was surprising that during slavery and Jim Crow, we created more in terms of our own independent institutions than we have done since we've been free. That's that's, that's quite amazing. Uh, and so yeah. we, we, we need to step back, particularly my generation and your generations and those who are coming after, and, and, and just basically began to say, what are we doing? As Dr. King would often say, you know, every generation must make a deposit into the vault of freedom, you see. Because if you don't make a deposit into the vault of freedom in America, you're going to uh, end up getting a check return marked insufficient funds. Freedom is not free. The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And the people who cannot preserve freedom ultimately do not deserve freedom. Mm, very profound. One of the things that uh, Jim and I talk about pretty regularly, and it, it, it kind of connects with what you're saying, um, you know, one, we, we always talk about that education begins at home. And every, every family should have their own library. And you can't you're afford right. to be dependent on public or private school institutions uh, to tell you who you are, what your history is, and or to validate your identity. But the other thing that I find very interesting, you know, as we are getting further into the 20th, 21st century, uh, that is, is that the the so-called spokespeople for the black community have, have, have changed, quite frankly, because I recall growing up, I, I don't remember listening 
or are really looking to entertainers or athletes, for instance. Nothing wrong with that in terms of um, them being influencers within our community, them being purveyors of history. But, uh, you know, when I came up, there was a different cadre of leadership that the black community yielded to, uh, whether it came from the church, whether it came from politicians, et cetera, in terms of setting the moral compass of our values, in terms of giving the community direction. That has changed dramatically uh, when we- no more Jim Browns, Tom. What's that, Jimmy? I said there's no more Jim Browns. Well, yeah, very, yeah, very, very few Jim Browns uh, for those you know that that were in that space with some degree of credibility. But I, I think what kind of concerns me, Professor Freedom, and you can speak to this, is that even though I think there's a sort of a sense a renaissance because of the act, the access to the democratization of cell phones and social media and things of that nature, we have a preponderance of folks who, quite frankly. I wouldn't say that they're in a position to be leaders in terms of where our community goes, but we have more entertainers who are speaking as the mouthpieces for our young people uh, in terms of the direction that we're going in. What do you see out there? That's just what I'm observing. Well, certainly the observation has has value. Uh, We have to understand, I submit from historical context, is that Sports and entertainment has been an evolving uh, area within our community in terms of the level of credibility and money that it has placed in the hands of African-American people. Prior to, again, I'm Jim Crow era, uh, having grown up doing Jim Crow, uh, watched my mother and father and my grandparents and others. And we look at things like Jackie Robinson, for an example, uh, integrating baseball, particularly uh, when there were the Negro League, you know, we we saw Jesse Owens, so forth. They were not making a lot of money. They were make, they were breaking barriers. Even Muhammad Ali and others at the time, you know, and much of what they were activist athletes, if you will. Yes, activist athletes, I agree. Uh, activist entertainers, you know. Sidney Poirier, you know, uh, Harry Belafonte, you know, Diane, I mean, just sort of Diane Carroll. So that was an activism always, even during the 60s when I was young in 70s, uh, their involvement. Dr. King and ministers and others like Dr. King and Adam Clayton Powell and others and, and, and the preachers of the church, particularly in the context of that history, the <laughs> preachers were the primary because the church was the power base. It was Correct. a power base. It was Correct. an independent power base. Uh, that was controlled by the African American community. Then later on, some were manipulated. But then, even going back to slavery, we need to understand the complexity of the plantation church as well, uh, and the two messages that were being uh, preached at eleven o'clock, and then other one that was being preached at six o'clock. Those were two different messages, you see. Uh, but as time has gone on with the social media and the technology, everybody, even as we are here tonight, everybody has falling into the category of someone being a conveyor of information, being factual or not, you see. Uh, but now they have access. I worked for IBM, as I said earlier, and I saw the whole evolution. There were two books that were written back then. One is called Megatrends by John Nesbitt. The other book is Future Shock by Alvin Toffler, which talked about what we're doing tonight and what you all are doing, what we're doing. And I actually have those two books on my shelf right now. Okay. (laughs) So, you know, we we, we knew this era was coming, you know? It it, it is how we manage it. So in response to your question is that today we are in a space and a place, given our political uh, climate that we have today, uh, regardless of Brother Jimmy mentioned his political uh, position, uh, you know, whether we were Republican or Democrat or conservative or, or whatever, but as African American people, we have it, it, it's very important to, to see what the climate is for us today, you see. Uh, and, and those of us who were activists were not, even myself, because after Dr. King, there are those of us who were still activists, but were not taken seriously for a period of years. Matter of fact, they put us back on the book, back shift. It was like we fell into the illusion of inclusion. <laughs> we were okay. there. Okay. We thought we had arrived. <clears throat> we did not need to 
uh, fight for voting rights anymore, defend the vote, right to vote. We didn't have to speak up for economic justice anymore. Was there a feeling that we won at that point? I beg your pardon? Was there a feeling that we had won at that point? Certainly. That's what that's what I call the illusion of inclusion. Okay. It was an illusion. Uh, and, and so subsequently, we we, we allow the, the fabric of our of freedom, the thread of freedom to unravel again. You see, and, and so subsequently, my generation, my mother's 90, you know, and those of us who were back there after Dr. King, you know, I was 10 years old when Dr. King was assassinated. Uh, I remember those times, those days. My father was a civil rights activist. My aunties were civil in Memphis. They were there uh, with Dr. King, uh, even the night that mm -hmm. he was uh, assassinated, the whole city. So my family, I grew up with that going back to Memphis. I sat on Dr. King's bed, the bed that he slept in the last night. My father took me there. I sat on that very bed before it came a national museum at the Mer uh, Rose Hotel. Uh, and then later on, worked. I worked with Mrs. King and Mrs. Rosa Parks, which we're now, uh, just the other day, the Congressional Black Caucus is trying to call for December 1st to be Rosa Parks Day, federal holiday. Well, we didn't do that with Dr. King's holiday. In the late 70s and early 80s, we were celebrating Dr. King's holiday. Thus, Stevie Wonder came up with the song later. But we were speaking, I was speaking uh, at SMU in 1981 on Dr. King's birthday. It wasn't a national holiday in the, in the 80s. It was a holiday because just like Juneteenth, nobody told the Af freed African men, the women, and we're going to have a holiday. No, they celebrated Juneteenth. <laughs> and it is what it is. So my point is that we don't go to the nation's capital and say, make Mrs. Rosie Parks' birthday a holiday. No, we say it is a holiday. Just like I said, the fourth month of October is African American Cotton Pickers Day. You know, I declare it that day. And the power of our voice and the power of our declaration uh, establishes really who we are. Because if we don't say who, what we want, and we, I don't need anybody to tell me when to celebrate something, you see. Mm -hmm. And so subsequently, uh, there was a, Brother Jimmy, uh, a period in which uh, economically, we, we sort of straight away, as they all say, the water was colder, the grass was greener. We left our ID, our communities proper. Yes, we did. That we had lived in by force, where we had been segregated. The real issue becomes, as we move forward, as we deal with this, my exhibition here that we're doing, what do, how do we want to live as a free people, as a free thinking African American people? And what does that mean? You know, as other immigrant groups who come here, you know, be from whatever country, but particularly a lot of our friends from Africa now, when they come here, they work together, they build together. You see, when I came to Dallas in 1979, uh, the, the term was, you know, we got to turn black. But while I was at DI, uh, SMU, we changed the word in that DISD. I was on the committee with DISD at the time to African American. And people wondered why. And I said that, and later on, it became very popular. From uh, from that point on, and not across the nation, it was because there is no geopolitical place called black. Geopolitical, there's no place on the map called black. There's a place called Asia. There's a place called Europe. You see, so who are we? Where do we come from? Uh, as one lady said to me uh, several years ago, she said, "Until I came to Dallas, the Dallas people didn't know they were Africans." You see. And what does that mean to know that one is an African person is to know that one has a historical geopolitical identity, a place, a, a, a culture, a continent, and that global identity that allows us to build that relationship both with our own culture globally and then interact with other cultures, be they European, be they Asian, be they indigenous American or whatever. Let me ask you this and not trying to be a provocateur. It's Please. just maybe a perception. And, and you bring up a very interesting point <clears throat> is that uh, Chinese have no problem, even though they may be second, third, fourth generation in American, they, they may still call themselves Chinese or Correct. You know, if you're Indian, they have no problem with their affiliation uh, with India. Um, if, if they're from Germany, whatever the case is. No problem. But you bring up a good point in terms of those who clearly are the descendants of Africans, but the 
what is the appropriate word to say? The reason that folks that we call African-Americans black in America have a difficult time calling themselves Africans. Well, it's, it's very clear. It was programmed into us. First of all, Africa is the law. It's the second largest continent, but it's the home of humanity. We know that now. Correct. Uh, all the research that points to that, the mitochondria Eve, uh, all of that, all human beings uh, uh, migrated out of the uh, continent of Africa, their bodies adapted to the physical surroundings, et cetera, et cetera. We all know that now. But for those who stayed in the, particularly the sub Sahara Africa uh, and those kingdoms that existed, the Congo, you know, uh, Shanghai, Mali, Timbuktu, uh, Kush, Kemet, uh, which is called Egypt, uh, Akabula, and the name some submit, but it's early Africa. Because, even at the Berlin Conference, you see, because at the Berlin Conference, they divided the country up into, into, into the countries we see today. Correct. Uh, and the whole attempt of European exploration slash exploitation was to uh, exploit this rich continent. This rich continent. Uh, and there was already internal structure, and then that's one of the things happened even during the movie Wakanda and uh, 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 Africa Queen, the Queen, uh, by the Woman King, is that in Africa there were kingdoms in South Africa, and they were just as ruthless then. You know, uh, we're not without our problems, first of all, but they exploited our problems, and that means that if a king wanted to get rid of a, uh, an enemy and so forth, we saw that in the but uh, the Owu people, the Dom, the Hami people, and Wakanda was a powerful movie that most of us just went straight over our head. You see, straight over here. We didn't understand Owu. We don't understand, like in uh, Woman King, the Dahomey people. Uh, uh, like my family is Ghana. From Ghana, I'm Ga and Yoruba. Uh, my God name is Yah, which is born on the Thursday. My uh, Yoruba name is Omo Baba Uluwu, which is son of cotton grower. Uh, and so we see that. And, and the reason my connection is because the Africans who went back to Liberia, my family, the Glover family. I went to the house of Glover in Ghana. There's the house of Glover in Nigeria. And those who were, Liberia was established as a country by Correct. freed African men and women. <laughs> and uh, Thompson, Johnson, Taylors, Glovers, and others went back. Uh, anyway, that's another piece. Uh, so when we begin to see that, the internal strife of the uh, fights in the division, because Europeans did not go into Africa and take the people out. That was a relationship with the rulers there, you see. It was a mutual uh, exploitation. Uh, so we, and that, we have to accept that reality. But then we must look at uh, what happened to us once we were brought here and the continual exploitation and the brainwashing that continued. And a part of that was to uh, take away that understanding of our indigenous identity as African people. People say enslaved, they, the new term now is enslaved people, they move from saying slave. I don't agree with enslaved people. Well, who are the people who were enslaved? They were enslaved Africans, principally from West Africa. So we're not from East Africa. We're not from South Africa. We're principally from what? Senegal, Ghana, Togo, West Africa. Food, black eyed peas, watermelon, gumbo, yams, you see? So we can look at our dialect, even how we speak. No TH sound, D, this, that, those, them. Come on, go on. Yeah. What we call the Gullah, which we are, many of us, coming from the Sea Islands of Georgia. So when we now accept that fact that we are from Africa and that uh, our culture was never destroyed, people always use that. Well, the white man destroyed our culture. No. You cannot destroy culture. Culture is like electricity. You can only transfer it or transform it. And our culture was transformed in America through the music, which we're talking about in Deep Ellum, uh, the blues into the spirituals and the jazz and the gospels and then to the bebop and the doo-wop and then to the hip-hop. See, hip-hop, mom and dad is named doo-wop and bebop. It's a genre of music. It's not the culture, you see. So... My generation, as I get older, <laughs> must become responsible as a griot, as a speaker, as a transmitter of information and knowledge at a time. And I will submit to you that, let me offer one book uh, to our listeners, uh, Laurent Bennett, my textbook at SMU that I use as a, one of my basic textbooks was by Laurent Bennett, 
they came before the Mayflower. Every yes. African American home should have Lerone Bennett. It's one of the most readable books. And as we talk about this ban on books, let's stop stop. Get the book, ladies and gentlemen. Start the movement in your own home. Get Lerone Bennett. It has an excellent uh, uh, line in the back. Every adult African American, and and, and and I'm swearing to you now, should become knowledgeable. We can't ex we can't uh, excuse uh, make someone else accountable for what we don't read. You see. Very true. Very true. <clears throat> no, before the Mayflower is a uh, mind altering book. I have that on my bookshelf. I highly recommend it as it well. Should be a, that should be a Bible, <laughs> and before the Mayflower. Yes. <laughs> so why don't we do this? Uh, we have about 20 minutes left. Um, and I, I, I don't want our listeners to be lost on what they're in store for for the next couple of ye a couple of weeks. I'm sorry um, for the exhibit that you have coming up. So I do want to talk a little bit more about that. And, and for those who are not historians, <laughs> but for the lay listeners understanding the significance and you talked about it earlier in the show, the significance of Cotton Pickers Day. It is in October. Most people, oh, Monday night. What, 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 what is that? Why should I care? What's, you know, why should it's I, also, what, is, what does it tell me to understand? Cotton was, from, cotton was uh, probably transported from Africa. It is the <clears throat> number one product of economic. We will look at the season that we just came out of uh, harvest time. Pumpkins did nothing for America. Cotton was the primary harvest crop. Uh, we were the ones who picked it. The cotton gin allowed the seeds to be taken out because of the uh, uh, process. Therefore, more of us were needed to pick the cotton. Uh, subsequently, it became the number one economic engine. Before cotton, it was wool in Europe, you see? That's why you see all those huge mansions over there and the uh, the spinning jenny and the, and the looms and the factories, etc. But cotton replaced that. So we became the instruments of the labor force for that. Uh, the exhibit is entitled uh, Cotton Pickers, Christmas and the Blues, because it was during Christmas that we see the greatest disparity between haves and have nots. So that those who at the end of the harvest season, who uh, took the uh, cotton crop and made the money had the greatest celebration. You see, they're fundamentally uh, five stages, six stages for cotton. There is the planting, uh, the chopping, the picking, the hoeing, and then the ginning. Then there's the selling. We did all five except sell. <laughs> Every plus, there was a saying during slavery: "Say never let a slave learn the value of cotton. Keep the African slave you are enslaved person, quote unquote, ignorant." Let me say to you, as I teach you, as I show it, when we spend money, every dollar bill we talk about, we always say paper money, paper money. Every dollar mm -hmm. bill in our pocket, $5, $10, is made from 75% cotton and 25% linen. There's no paper in it. This is why you can wash in your pants, praying out dry, and keep spending it. You can't do that with paper. Paper disintegrates in water in your pants or whatever. Also, when you look at a bell of cotton, which I'm going to have on exhibit, I'll have a 500-pound bell of cotton. I'll have a 110-pound bag. Uh, of, of cotton that I've picked over the years. Um, I mean, I have two bags I've picked, uh, but I'm going to have one on display. Uh, I'll have a, a, a gin, a, a hand gin on display, many, many, many things like that. But every 500 pound bill of cotton, one 500 pound bill of cotton produces 313,600 $100 bills. Let me say mm. that again. Every bale of cotton produces 313,600 $100 bills. So for almost 20 years here in this country, European Americans created a system of economics on the plantation system that trickled down to the lower that was able to take that money and build communities and families and generational wealth while African Americans who engaged in five of the processes never reap the benefits. Nothing during slavery. And you may get 50 cents and 100 during Jim Crow. By the time the uh, tractor came along in the 1950s and really in the 60s, because I, I remember again, I picked cotton, my great grandfather. 
the truck. My, we, my uncle had my great uncle had mules, so I, I've done tractors, all that. But by the time the tractor under John Deere was perfected, people were still picking it by hand. Now, what we did, we cursed the cotton rather than condition. Women know that the best cotton in the world is Egyptian cotton. And the reason is the best cotton because you pick it by hand, not with the machines with all this trash. When you pick the cotton by hand, you have a better quality fiber. I submit to you, there's nothing wrong with picking cotton. There was something wrong with not getting picked, getting paid for picking cotton. Just as is, there's nothing wrong for working with, for working hard. There's something wrong for not getting paid for working hard. So we reversed it. We cursed the cotton and stopped working. This is white gold. This is called white gold in America, literally, and it is. So if any other, like South Africa, they have diamonds. I submit to you, because I worked with the anti-apartheid movie with Bishop Tutu, Alan Bosak, during the uh, 70s. Okay. And we sat and talked about it. What would happen after apartheid when uh, Nelson Mandela would be free? We're talking about the diamonds that were in those gold mines, those, those men would dig. Do you think those men stopped and started just saying, those old dirty diamonds, we're not going to pick, we're not going to dig diamonds anymore? <laughs> No, they knew the difference between the product, the diamond, and the condition apartheid. We didn't. We have not made a distinction between the product cotton and the condition slavery slash Jim Crow. Okay. <clears throat> we should know our land. This is what I'm trying to do. Get us to know who is your where, where is your grandfather's land, and this is for men since we this a men. A man and his land go hand in hand, and a man without land is not much of a man. So where is the land of your family, your people, even your house? If you have a house and you're living in it right now, you have a front yard or backyard, I submit, I do this all the time. What are you doing with that land? I go collard greens uh, uh, in my yard, by my front yard, I, I have grow tomatoes, I, uh, I grow okra, uh, I grow peas, I have seven hens in the back, I have an urban farm. Uh, I just cooked my greens outside the other day on the with like African pot cookie on my pit. You see, a man has to be able to work his land, gentlemen, and provide for his family. Okay. So for those who might ask, okay, so most folks today don't touch a bell of cotton, but it's not the essence of touching the cotton, which by the way, my mother, my relatives, uh, pick cotton when they were young, but it's really advocating for the, the the messaging behind the significance of what our ancestors went through, lived through, and what we should be doing today. Otherwise, well, no, making, no, no, make, no. Make, making it clear today as to what we're advocating for. No, well, first of all, we should advocate. There are, there are African American farmers today. First of all, correct. African American um, cotton farmers. First of all, okay. Today. But but most folks do not touch cotton. Well, no, I, I'm saying, but uh, what, what I'm saying first, we need to understand that African Americans and cotton should be a connection. There should be a connection. Okay. Again, you say touch cotton. What you just said, uh, 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 Brother Duncan, you know, that's a psychological thing, okay? Mm -hmm. That's nothing wrong with touching cotton. Oh, no. I <laughs> mean, no, see, no, no, no. That's no, nothing no, wrong no, no. with the cotton content. What right. I'm saying to us is that what we have done, not only have we done with cotton, but we have moved away from manual labor. Most young African-American men do not work manual labor, sir. Agreed. Agreed. And subsequently, Agreed. because of this view of the cotton field, the hard work, you see, we have created a generation of young men who, who, who that, 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 that really do, know very little about manual labor, how to, how to cut grass, how to change a tire, how to, how to hammer, how to saw. And we've seen that. other cultures who are built. There's nothing wrong with manual oh, labor. No, 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 never said the backbone. Then never you have technology it. on the other side because manual labor and technology have now merged, if you will. You see? Correct. When I grew up, it was a hammer and nail like this, you know, with post hole digging. Now all of these things are done with what? Computerized machines and computerized hammer, boom, 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 so forth and so on. But even the building of a house is very mathematical still, you see? And so you know, we Professor, have. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, sir. We have to convey if we're talking about black men speak, we have to ask the question. And I'll be very personal as I ask you and others, as Brother Jimmy, and other, but is that because I, I, 
when I look at my father, my grandfather, and what they handed to me, and I look at the generations after me, what are you all doing? What are your what is your generation doing to be manually labor? What are you doing with your land? What are you doing? We can't get away from those conversations. We can't sidestep them anymore. We have to ask the fundamental question: is that women bear nations, gentlemen? Correct. Men build nations. Let me say that again. Women what? Bear nations. Bear nation. Women build men build nations. There's a uh, commercial on television, you may have seen it now, where the woman is getting ready to go to uh, the uh, hospital and uh, the garage door is stuck. And she looked at her husband and she said, you had nine months to get the door fixed. <laughs> and they're sitting in the garage. She's about to deliver her child. That's on television now. The man had nine months. You see, in Africa, if you a woman gets pregnant, the man is supposed to be building the what? The house. <sighs> building the house. So we have to challenge, charge ourselves and challenge ourselves. So coming out uh, on Saturday at uh, uh, down in Deep Ellum, you'll get a chance to engage in looking at manual things again. <laughs> you see, understanding that, that we have to value uh, cotton and land and begin to own the land and begin to get into the cotton industry. But matter of fact, I'm working with the National Association of Cotton right now. I'm talking to them. But you know, if, if you if you're in the t-shirt business, you're in the cotton business. <laughs> if you make a t-shirt, you so Jimmy. the 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 many different companies and etc. But if there's a question from your audience, I would love to share because if you could put the uh, uh, post up uh, and let them see down at 2825 Deep Elm, across from the Pittman Hotel uh, on Saturday. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Christmas, Christmas and the blues. And we'll be at 2825 at the, um, in the, uh, in the um, Deep Ellum Community Center there on in Deep Ellum uh, on Saturday from 2 to uh, 6, 2 to 4 on Saturday, uh, 2528 Elm Street, Deep Ellum Community Center. Uh, we would love to have you come out. Uh, I have a group coming from Louisiana. As a matter of fact, they've called me. They're going to come from Southern Shreveport. Uh, uh, they, they, and, and, and people come to Dallas for culture. They come from small towns around here. So we're in Dallas. We need to kind of up our game so that let people know things have some culture for African-American people. But if there are any questions. All right. I can't see the through. chat line, Tom, dude. I can see Check the chat out. line. There aren't any questions yet, but we have a few minutes. So for those who are on our chat line, um, we uh, welcome you to ask any questions about um, what Professor Glover has been sharing today. Of course, the um, the, the exhibit that's going to be going on over the next couple of weeks, uh, starting uh, this weekend. Right, yes. about that. Uh, so do feel free to ask any questions that you might have so that Professor uh, Glover can address those. Uh, While well, we still have a few minutes uh, left on our show, but this is this has been out, absolutely outstanding. And so, let, let me share this with you. I know, Brother Ed, I see that I've known him from SMU days, but so I'm challenging the African American community in Dallas. I'm not from Dallas, but I'm from Shreveport, uh -huh. and Shreveport and Dallas really connect. They call it East Texas almost because in Shreveport, our streets are called Texas Avenue, uh, Fannin, Travis, after the Alamo. You understand? Yes. Cotton Street. There's a direct link between Shreveport and, uh, uh, you know, uh, every, do I have a book? No, I do not have a book. I have articles. Uh, when you Google Professor Glover, you can go, you can read some articles, particularly from Dallas Observer. Uh, that You can Google that article tonight. Uh, Dallas Observer, Professor Clarence Glover and Cotton. It'll come up right now if you look for it. And as and, if you could repeat the time, um, uh, location, address. Yes, of, of uh, the, we'll be at uh, 2528 Elm Street, 2528 Elm Street in the uh, Deep Elm Community Center, which is just opened this year. Uh, and, uh, and so, the, brother, is that brother Ephraim there? Yeah, Ephraim Zamel. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, from SMU, <laughs> very good. Uh, former students and others at SMU when I was there. Uh, but I, I challenge, particularly men, I'm going to put this out tonight. I challenge the men of this city. I am challenging you to come out during the next two weeks in Deep Ellum. Let's walk Deep Ellum again. 
let's walk Elm Street again, okay? Men and women, you know, you go down there now, uh, during the day, it's very quiet, you know, but mm -hmm. now it just become a place of, 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 of uh, well, on Van God and shooting and killing at night, you see. Oh. But we, we'll be through by six o'clock and we'll be out. You can park free on the streets until six. What okay. What is the, if, if there is kind of like a flow to what's going to be, I, I know it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So yeah. is there a flow? Is there something specific that's going to be happening on each day? Or, or how, how is it going to well, work? No, the first opening day is going to be Saturday. Okay. Uh, last closing day is going to be on the 31st. Okay. I will be at the, the first, of course, the exhibit would be at, like going to a museum. You know, you, you go to there to see, you know, and the experience, like you go to the African American Museum. But the difference here, I'll be there doing more gallery talks. Uh, as I did at the African American Museum, I, during the State Fair, I won. Um, uh, I had my 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 exhibit called the Cotton Bowl. Uh, won an exhibit at the State Fair this year. It was on, it was on a display all during the State Fair, and I did classes at it in the in the African American Museum, and, and so it's, this is growing. See the Cotton Bowl, and the reason they called the Cotton Bowl is because cotton was the primary. Uh, product here in, in in Dallas, and that was Dallas, uh, East Dallas. East Dallas and Dallas s s towns were not the same. Uh, General uh, Gaston started East Dallas, then it was annexed to Dallas to become the largest, uh, one of the largest cities in Texas. But it comes from the East, coming out of Georgia and others. That's why I say Stephen of Austin, coming through Military Parkway, all the streets. That whole East Dallas community, just like Oak Cliff was a separate town, and that was William Brown Miller. He had the second largest plantation in the state of Texas, you see. So there's so much history that African-Americans in general need to know and understand, but I'm specifically because of what we're talking about black men speak. I'm challenging the black men in Dallas uh, to come out because there was an attempt to suppress the black male's voice because in 1860, gentlemen, the city of Dallas was burned down and there was a movement across this whole area from Waxahachie and these men were lynched, Cato and others. Mm -hmm. And then they did beatings of African-American men after that connected to this whole cotton connection. But my point is that the African-American male's voice has been a suppressed voice in this city. Uh, and until you really take cotton, my goal is to bring cotton at the center. If you can build a, a build a, 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 the biggest, I guess, the, a monument and call it the Cotton Bowl, B-O-W, playing on the concept of the Cotton Bowl. This is a Cotton Bowl right here. That's the bowl of cotton right there that the cotton sits in. And they play on it, call it the Cotton Bowl, which was a plantation. The Cotton Bowl was an 80-acre cotton plantation, just like Love Field was a cotton plantation. You see? Mm -hmm. this is, and for those who are from Dallas, and because I'm a historian, I go deeper. And most times, if you're from a, if you if you live in a place, you don't study a place. It's like Dr. King, uh, when Martin Luther King uh, the Third and I would be together traveling. He would always say, "You know a lot. You know a whole lot about my dad." <laughs> I said, "I said you don't study your dad." <laughs> <laughs> I do, and so we don't study our parents, right? So, you know, they're our parents. Good point. Very, very uh, good point. When we live in a city, we don't study the city. You know, basically, we live in the city. So just like other men who came to Dallas or to Texas, uh, other pioneers, and I am a pioneer, by the way, and I and I accept that fact. But my family, the Glover family, and I'm going to close on this point, uh, coming into Military Park where there's William Glover Cemetery. Uh, George Glover came here from Alabama, where my, my family is from. We took our name from the White Glovers of Alabama. Uh, there's mm -hmm. the Glover Park. And there's the Glover Pass. When I came here in 79, everybody asked me, you, you know about these gloves? I didn't understand that. I didn't know. But now I know. I've been to the cemetery. I've been a part of the family uh, gatherings. Uh, my great-grandfather, my Uncle Sandy, my grandfather's father, was named William Glover from Alabama. Mm. So I'm suggesting to you that, and, and I've been speaking to the Dallas white pioneers, and I'm saying to you that any African-American person who came to Texas as a result of the Peters Colony, where they gave every European American man who was married 640 free acres of land, along with their enslaved people, and 320 acres. Wait a minute. Free land. You said every every man that came to Texas got 640 free acres. Of land. 
Peter's colony, when they colonized the state of Texas, uh, yes, Stephen of Austin, the impresarios, they gave every European man to colonize over 300 families. If you were married, they gave you 640 acres. If you were single, you got 320 free acres free. Where I live, William Cochran had this part of North, of the, where I live, William Cochran brought the first cotton to North Texas, Farmer's Branch, as we call it up here in yes. this area, Farmer's yes. Branch. So I'm just saying to this, I, um, I'm not retired now, I'm refired. And <laughs> so my job is now is to share. And then for the community to support, let me say, this is a free exhibition, but we are accepting donations. It should Absolutely. be sponsored and supported. But until that time that we support our own, you know, you know we, have, right. we have to pump, as we say in the country, we have to prime the pump first. That takes True. a little water. Gotcha. There are a couple of things in the uh, chat line. Um, co co-worker passed uh, that was Jewish and went, he went to South Dallas where a huge graveyard. I wonder why it is there. Um, Audrey K. Booker, that's right over here in my neighborhood, uh, the cemetery that you're speaking of. Dr. about Greenwood? I'm not as sure if she's speaking specifically of Greenwood. Uh, maybe she can clarify that. But mm -hmm. And again, there's so much rich history here. T tonight we can't do it all, but I'm glad to see that the, 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 the responses are here. And we'll be there for two weeks. Uh, my number is 214-546-3480. Again, 214 five four six three four eight zero if you'd like to help sponsor this uh, exhibit do its duration we invite you to uh, to come uh, again uh i was brought up that if you believe in something deep enough uh you put your money where your mouth you see All right i agree yeah <laughs> absolutely so as we are closing out jimmy uh, it's already the uh, top of the hour we want to thank uh, professor glover again Thank you so much, uh, sir. Uh, his thoughts, and we are asking, challenging um, everybody who is watching this show tonight to go out and uh, support this exhibit starting on the 6th. And bring a friend, Tom. And, exactly. And bring your family and friends to this extremely important exhibit as Don't let well. the park it. Don't let the park it. The parking is challenging. Uh, okay. Down now, in where, where, so, so where should you be parking? Or As I said, the street parking is free until 6 o'clock. Okay. So try to find some on the streets, but there are lots around the area. Uh, and, you know, of course, they pay lots, but uh, don't let this discourage you. We pay for what we want to go and see. Th th this is true. Very right. true. When we look at what people will spend money for, yes, we will pay for what we want. <laughs> I'm, exactly. not gonna even, I'm not going to even go into some of the stuff that I see people who are willing to pay for. <laughs> uh, plenty of money, Professor. Plenty of money. And I've been putting a lot of work in, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, why don't we do this? Uh, we'll give you one last uh, moment to just kind of make a closing comment and then we will um, close out today's show. We just want to thank you so much again for uh, sharing this information thank with you. us. And we are uh, definitely going to uh, support the event over the next couple of weeks. And we're going to, of course, advocate uh, our listeners and other folks in the community to do the same because th this is what we have to do. As I was with my mother at her 90th mm -hmm. birthday pass in November, who's 90 years old mm -hmm. in a nursing home um, with Alzheimer's, and I reflect on her very rich life and all that she's given uh, to me and to my family, my sisters and brothers, and my father who passed in 81 when I was here in Dallas. We are in a, trans we are in a generational transition, ladies and gentlemen, literally. Uh, my uh, condolences out to Craig Watkins, I knew his uncle Ted, NAACP, his father, you know. Um, but we are in a transitional generation where our elders uh, are growing. I'm growing over the. <laughs> uh, we must take this time very seriously and contemplate how we communicate with each other and pass on. Secondly, uh, many of my brothers and sisters who are from Africa, who I've worked with for over 40 years in this city, have now become strategic economic players. You see them on television shows, you see them on everywhere. They own land and property everywhere. We must make that connection with them if we're going to be serious about 
economics. Uh, as a pastor of First African Freedom Church, not only do I have members here, but we have a congregation in Ghana, West Africa, and Bonaway, Ghana. One of my members has already chosen to go back and move back to Africa as a result of our relationship with our community there. Uh, if I choose one day, uh, I can choose to go back. You can build very comfortably over there, you see, and owning property in Africa with dual citizenship, you see. So let's get serious about that. And as uh, we close, that's what I'm doing. And I will say to you uh, from the context of ministry, as we look at the gospel uh, story, particularly the Old Testament, uh, we can learn from those messages and sermons. And one of the first songs that they sang in the cotton field, that be, uh, which is my family's song, we sang it every time we gather at the table to eat, it was Jacob's Ladder. And so as we embrace that, as I wear my uh, Lion of Judah here, and as we embrace our Old Testament story of freedom, just as the Hebrew children embrace their story of freedom and the, the night they uh, uh, look at their liberation night uh, and talk about it to their children. December 31st is Watch Freedom Night. Yes. Watch Freedom Night. Let us take that seriously if we're in church. Put freedom in there. Watch Freedom Night. January the 1st is Jubilee Day. It is two and a half years late coming to Texas because of many things, but primarily the cotton, the 180,000 African-American men who fought in the Union Army, who became the Buffalo Soldiers. We must tell these stories, ladies and gentlemen. And when you say Ju January 1st being Jubilee Day, is that synonymous with Emancipation Day? Or are we talking That's about Emancipation Day? Yes. Gotcha. Got you. Black, black, and, and oh, by the way, I am making Hopping John for this Saturday. Oh, yeah. And, uh, turkey tails, smoked turkey tails, black eyed peas, and rice. And uh, yes, sir. So it's going to be a taste. I am not trying to feed you that, but it'll be a taste <laughs> of Hopping John. And Hopping John is one of the foods that we will make with our back then pork. I don't eat pork, yes, meat. I don't eat meat. But don't it, eat. it will be um, it was part of our food diet. And uh, if I could bring some collard greens and as I would, but uh, let's continue that. So I want to see our men uh, and some of that. Most of the women, most of the gardens that are now being uh, raised in, in the urban garden are by women, by women. I need some brothers, some men. Yes. Absolutely. Well, in that right. case, uh, you, we, we've got the challenge and Jimmy, we're going to, uh, uh, be up to it. So we want to thank you again, Professor Glover. Of course, um, if we don't see yeah, you thank before you that, again. if we don't see you before then, uh, very, very have a very happy holiday season, you and your family. Of course, uh, we're going to have to have you back whenever you have the uh, time, and we'll definitely look forward to seeing you at the exhibit over the next couple of weeks. We look forward to you and your guests coming, and bring your children, your families, and bring your cotton and your dollars. Yes, sir. Because your dollars. There you go. Because your dollars. But is your cotton. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.